Romans 1 tells me, now this is something I didn't know until about seven or eight years ago, long at five years after I'd become a Christian. And I would talk to atheists, right? And I would say, okay, atheists, you say you're an atheist. What you need to find out about is the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the moral argument, all these different arguments. And then whenever you hear all these arguments, you'll believe in God. Well, I tried that on atheists. You guys ever try that with atheists? Does it ever work? Never works, right? So, so you start reading the Bible, and here's the, here's the thing, okay? When you read the Bible, it says this. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them, right? For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. So what that tells us is that every human being made in God's image, which is everybody, that's why racism is always evil because human beings are made in God's image. Every human being knows that God exists. Everybody. Right? It doesn't matter. So they, they're saying with their mouth they're an atheist, but they're not really an atheist. We were just talking over there. Um, here's an illustration, okay? I know it's politically incorrect, but all right, don't, don't take it wrong, okay? If I came out today and I said, okay, I'm a male, I'm a man, but I, I want to be a female, right? And of course, in our culture, as backwards as it is, we say, oh, okay, that's cool, man. You can be a female today. But in reality, I can't change my gender. Biology won't let me. My chromosomes aren't going to change. I'm always a male. That's how God has made me. God in his sovereignty has created me to be a male, right? It doesn't matter what I say. So I can come out today and say, I want to identify as a banana. It doesn't make me a banana. Same way with the atheist. An atheist can say all day long, well, I want to be an atheist. It doesn't make him an atheist, okay? All they're doing, what they're doing, it says it right here, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. What they're doing is they're holding down the truth. Just like you would, uh, for instance, out here. I mean, it's hot out. I'm from New Mexico, man, and this heat out here is brutal. I tell you, this is another level of, 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 of heat. Um, but I tell you, when you go into a swimming pool with a beach ball and you try to hold a beach ball underwater, what happens? It comes up. You can't hold it down, right? And so that's what atheists are trying to do with God. They try to suppress the truth of God. They can't do it. It keeps popping up. And so that's why we can say, listen, you are not an atheist. You're not really, or even an agnostic. You're not an agnostic. You're not, you know, when they say, well, I, I, quite, I haven't quite decided whether or not God exists. Well, they have decided. They know that God exists. They can't help that. That's how God has made them. They live in God's universe. They're made in God's image. They have a conscience. That's the reason. Now, can anybody... Can anybody tell me why it is that somebody would be motivated to be an atheist? What would motivate someone to be an atheist? Why do they say that, in other words? Because it's not an evidence problem. We'll talk about that in a minute. But why, you know, just in y'all's own experience, why do people say they are atheists or agnostic? Sin. Who said sin, right? I mean, think about it. Okay, listen. We all know what it's like. So... I don't know what brand of, of Christians are out here, obviously, right? But I believe the Bible teaches that every one of us is born in sin. We're all born in sin. And you don't, no, nobody starts out as a Christian, in other words, right? We all need to be forgiven. If you're a Christian today, there was a point in your life, whether or not you're aware of that point, you know, a lot of, a lot of times you are, a lot of times you're not, when you're actually saved, converted. Okay? But before that, you were lost, right? And so we can all understand and identify with the lost person who loves sin because that used to be us, right? We used to also love sin. And even as Christians, obviously, we, we, are, we are fighting that battle every day against sin, okay? But if I was an unbeliever, one of the predicates of being an unbeliever, one of the requirements is I don't like God. I don't like God. Because God is the governor of all things. God rules my life. God is, is my judge, right? People hate to be judged if they're not Christians, okay? I don't want God, I don't want God to exist. I really don't want God to exist. Whether or not I, I get to the point of saying that, but that's what's motivating the unbeliever. Because they have to protect their conscience. Um, another way to think of it is, so God has put that conscience in them, right? How awkward would it be to be an unbeliever, to have a conscience that is always telling you that you're wrong, that, that, that what you believe about God is, is wrong, you're, you're in rebellion against God, you're living in sin, and that conscience is always going off. So you have to come up with some kind of defense mechanism to protect yourself from your conscience. That's what atheism is. That's what agnosticism is. That's what false religions are when they tell you, well, you got to do good works. Because now you're in the mindset, well, I can actually earn this thing. 
as opposed to just submitting to God and crying out for mercy like the tax collector beat his chest saying, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Y'all see that? So it's a defense mechanism to quiet the conscience. Okay, any other any questions on that so far? No? Okay, everybody good on that? Because what is very important out here, my friends, okay, is you guys deal with unbelievers all the time. This is not a, a Christian environment, right? You go to class. Um, how are you, ma'am? So I was a, uh, when I was in college, I was a philosophy major and, a, and an English literature major. I double majored in college. And then, uh, and I was never around Christians. And I was a Christian. I was saved by God's grace. And, and by God's grace, he kept me saved. <laughs> um, and, then, and then I went and I got a master's degree in philosophy. And I, my, my, whole, my whole premise was, is I'm going to try to sneak in Christianity to my peers, right? Because you're a missionary here. You're, you're amongst the unbelievers here. You're amongst people who are at war with God, who are not right with God. They're walking around upside down. They're made for the creator, but they live for the creation, right? You're missionaries here. And so what we have is missionaries. I want to read you something out of Matthew. You know, one of the greatest passages that I, that I think of when it comes to this kind of environment that you're in is Matthew 28. You guys know what Matthew 28 is? Anybody ever off the top of your head? The Great Commission, right? And the, the beauty about the Great Commission is this. When Jesus came to them and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That right there is the most encouraging thing that you can have as a Christian. Because, see, this does not say that all authority will be given to me. It says it is given to me. All authority belongs to Jesus Christ right now. And that's why somebody has said every square inch of this universe belongs to Jesus Christ. This campus belongs to Jesus Christ. The classrooms belong to Jesus Christ. The teachers belong to Jesus Christ because he is Lord over the entire universe. He's God over the entire universe, right? But here's the thing. At the end of the Great Commission passage, after he says, therefore, go, go, therefore, into all the world, baptize, make disciples, things. At the very end of that, he says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And in the, in the original language there, that's a, it's a, it's a, a double um, emphasis. It's saying it's at the very beginning, and it's the, the emphasis is on who is with us. It is Christ who is with us. I am with you even to the end of the age. And so when you're here today, right, and you're going in, and you're amongst the unbelievers and you don't know what to say, you don't, know how to, you don't know how to share Christ, you don't know what to do. My friends, Christ has all authority. And he, if, if you're in Christ today, and sincerely, you know, if you're a true believer today, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And he's going to teach you what to say. We should study our scriptures, right? We should be in prayer. We should avoid sin, all, all those things. But we have, to, we have to trust that God is mighty enough to save. And Christ himself, remember what Christ said, fellas? He said his sheep will hear his voice. That's the beauty. If you've ever wondered why in the world, now I know you guys get a lot of campus preachers here, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not one of those guys, I promise. Um, but I'll, I'll say this. One of the beauties about going to a college campus and preaching the gospel is that I know that Christ's sheep are going to hear his voice. And I know that Christ's sheep are going to follow that Christ that I'm preaching whenever they hear his voice. Right. And I know this, my friends, here's the thing. I also know this. Should we be surprised? OK. Any questions so far? Because I got to say this. All right. Professing Christians are very often. I know none of you are like this, but they're very often saying we can um, push people away. Right. And and I don't know. I've wrestled with this quite a bit. Is it possible to push somebody further away? I guess it is, but here's the reality, okay? If they're not in Christ today, Romans 3 tells us that they're not seeking for God. The unbeliever's not seeking for God. Romans also tells us that they're hostile in mind against God, right? Romans, Jeremiah 17, 9 says their heart is deceitful above all things. Job tells us that they drink down sin like it was water, just like we all did. You know, we were, we were all that way until we're born again. Right. So so in other words, we're dealing with people and especially like this. OK, Second Corinthians four says, even if our gospel is veiled. All right. So, we're, you know, if you're wearing a mask today, your, your face is veiled behind your mask. Right. But this is saying our gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. Is that not crazy or what? I love my friends. I love the Bible when you're evangelizing because the Bible comes to life. And you're talking to somebody about Christ and you're like, man, how come they just don't get this? 
And you're like, wait a minute, that's what the Bible says, right? There will be some who are not perishing and will be saved, right? But the vast majority, Christ says, the, the vast majority of people, they're, they're on the broad path that leads to destruction, right? I mean, we want everybody to be saved, but that's just not the reality. I mean, it could be if God moves, right? I mean, every time I come out here, I pray that God would do a work out here and save everybody on the campus because he can do that, right? And there have, there have been revivals in the past. So that's possible. But the reality is, is if I'm talking to somebody, was anybody out here yesterday? I know a few of you were. You know, so there was a group right here and they were professing pagans. They said, well, we're pagans, right? And it's like, it's such an, an amazing thing. When I asked the pagan, she says, racism is evil. And I say, okay, why according to paganism? She says, well, it just is. Okay, and you say, well, why? But why, right? You got, I mean, you can't just say just because, because the pedophile can say, well, it's okay to rape children just because, right? You have to, I mean, there's got to be some basis for that. You know, and as Christians, we can say, well, it's because every person's made in God's image. But a pagan can't say that. An atheist has no argument to, and that's the beauty of being a Christian. We don't have to live that way. We don't have to speak that way. You know, anytime any kind of moral argument, my friends, anytime that is brought up, you have them already because they're making claims they can't back up. You know, when they're talking about truth, that's why the sign says, without God, science is impossible. Now, this is a really neat subject. You guys ever heard this? What, what do you think that means? That without God, science is impossible. Ex and in what way, my friend? That's right. That's right. That's right. Now, if you're an atheist, right, then you're living in a worldview that tells you that everything is governed by chaos and chance and randomness. Everything's random, right? And everything continues to be random, right? There's no, there's no order in it. There's no goal. There's no, there's no end mark. There's no end point, okay? And so if that's the universe you're living in, the, anybody out here a, a science major, biology? Any, you are, no kidding. Do you know, and I, if you don't, that's okay. I certainly did not know it when I was in college, strange enough. But do you know the scientific method? Listen, what, what's the scientific method? It's hard when you put on the spot. I, I know, I know. I know, especially, right? I know, I know. It, does anybody? Okay, right. Well, that's part of it, right? Does anybody know how you start out? Yeah, my man. Okay, before you have a hypothesis, you got to do what? Observe, right? It starts with observation, okay? So the unbeliever can observe something. The believer observes, right? We, are, we observe our natural realm, and we make certain conclusions based on what we observe, okay? But here's the thing. When you're, you make a hypothesis, then you test your hypothesis. And one of the important things about the scientific method is that you have to repeat your test. Now, if I live in a universe that's governed by chance and chaos and randomness, how can I be certain that whenever I repeat my test, everything's not going to change? In fact, it would be the opposite. Everything has to change because I live in a universe of chaos and chance, right? And so what I'm saying is that the unbeliever can do science. They do do science, right? They probably teach science, but they cannot account for how the scientific method works, okay? The science of modern science, the, the scientific method originated in a Christian worldview because Christians recognize, like my man pointed out, that God has created the world with certain laws in them, and they are, they're governed by a God not of chaos, but of order. Remember, God's not a, an author of confusion, right? So he holds the universe. Christ holds the universe together, it says in Colossians 1. And so they knew that. Also, in the 1500s, 1600s, okay, that is a universe that's still dominated by, uh, no offense if you're a Roman Catholic, okay, but the Roman Catholic worldview of that time it was very uh, eministic, which means that God is so eminent in the creation that there's really no distinction between God and the creation. And so if you were to actually go and investigate the universe, what that would do, my friends, is that would lead to, uh, it would be an act that was sacrilegious, because now you're tampering with God himself. Because God is so involved, so intimate in his universe, and, and as far as like being the same thing, okay? The Protestant Christians, and I'm not, I'm not trying to preach a denomination. All I'm trying to point out is that they recognize that God, anybody out here read Genesis chapter one? Okay, chapter two, chapter three, right? The, well, especially chapter one and chapter two. There is something that's called a cultural mandate that comes from God, which tells us to what? What, what do we, and I, so the cultural mandate, that's just a fancy term for saying that God has called us to subdue the earth. 
to be fruitful, to multiply, and to subdue the earth. That gives us the license to explore the earth that God has created and to, to harness that earth and to use that earth as Christians, right? Not only for ourselves, but we want to use that earth for our neighbors. We want to better our neighbors too. That's why Christianity, modern science, is the one. And in fact, our universities come from Christianity. Our hospitals come from Christianity. Um, hotels come from Christianity. These are things that came from a Christian worldview. Um, some would say even modern, modern medicine. I'm not talking about medicine. Everybody's always used medicine. But modern medicine, as far as the advancement of it, has come because of a Christian worldview. So next time somebody says, well, what has religion, especially Christianity, ever done for the earth? You can start by saying, well, the universities, the hospitals, the hotels, modern medicine. Um, and not only that, my friends, you know what my favorite subject is, though, really? is logic. Um, anybody ever take a logic class? Logic is really interesting because... If I were to say, next time, because you'll hear this. My friends as Christians, you'll hear this. If, they'll, they'll tell you, I don't believe in God because I don't see God. I don't believe in God because you can't, you can't prove God scientifically. Okay? Now you have to ask them, do you hold that standard for everything in the universe? And they would say yes. But all you have to do is point out the laws of logic or the scientific method itself. You cannot test the scientific method by using the scientific method. You cannot test the laws of logic by using the scientific method. Do y'all know why? What, anybody, uh, let's say philosophy majors, any math majors out here? No? All right, man. I, I wasn't either of those things either, so I can't. But, you know, here's the thing, though, okay? So numerical law, and they say that most professors, most, most mathematicians, they believe in some kind of deity, they recognize that something has to exist beyond ourselves, beyond our universe, because of numerical law. Because numerical law is so perfect. Numerical law is unchanging. Going back to the atheist worldview, an atheist cannot account for numerical law. Because if you're saying the atheist has to say everything's material, numerical law is immaterial. Numerical law is not material. You can't see it, right? You can't observe it. Numerical law, two plus two. In fact, my friends, I've, I've asked people at universities, could two plus two someday become five? And they tell me yes. If you're an atheist, you have to say it's possible for two plus two to become five. Right? Why? Because that's the universe that you live in. Everything is in a current constant state of flux and chaos and randomness and confusion. Okay? But as a Christian, see, if you go to your math professor and you can tell your, your non-Christian friend, go to your math professor and ask them if two plus two will ever be five. Or if you get a bad grade on your math test, just say, well, you know, professor, in a billion years from now, this could be the right answer, not the wrong answer, right? Because math is always evolving. But the laws of logic are the same thing. The laws of logic, every time I form a sentence, I'm using the laws of logic. Every time I think, every time you and I speak, we're using the laws of logic to do so. The laws of logic are, are basically, they're laws, they're immaterial laws. You can't see them, you can't taste them, you can't touch them, you can't test them empirically. But in order to do science, you have to have them. In order to speak, you have to have them. What's great is that they're immaterial, and God too is immaterial. God is a spirit, right? That's why you tell your friend, well, you can't test God empirically by the scientific method because God is a spirit. Just like the laws of logic are immaterial, just like numerical law is immaterial. He's spirit, right? He's, he's something that you can't see with your senses, but you know, he's, you know he's there, just like the laws of logic. You know they exist. The laws of logic are universal. They're everywhere. If I went to China, they would still be the same. If I went to Mars, it would still be the same. That's the same thing with God. He's everywhere. He's unchanging. That's the same thing with laws of logic. By definition, they can't change. And the same thing with God. He doesn't change. So what I'm saying, my friends, is know this, okay? If you're a believer today, you are armed with, with incredible weapons, to fight the good fight of faith, especially when it comes to evangelism, apologetics, when you're talking to unbelievers, you are equipped, especially in the Word of God, with everything you need to know, right? Everything you need to know is in the Scriptures. But even if you want to get outside, not of the Scriptures, because we're still in the Scripture when we say these things, but if you're talking about things like, well, how do I convince my, my atheist friend that God exists, right? Well, he already knows God exists. So now you just got to press him about why it is that he's claiming to be an atheist. Expose his sin. Talk about, talk about what is driving this desire for, for God not to exist. Even in the face of crazy contradictions. 
right? So you could tell the pagan lady, well, well, ma'am, you say that racism is evil, but you have no argument for that. And I say racism is evil, and I have a very clear argument for that, right? And she's even telling me, well, everybody just knows racism is evil. And I'm like, well, well, then why do you have to go around saying it? Why, why, does, why is that the big topic right now, right? Obviously, it's not as obvious as you think it is. So if that's the case, how do you have an argument to actually convince somebody that it is evil? You can't just say it is because it is, right? But even in that sense, my friends, unless God is drawing that poor lady, she's never going to come to Christ because it's a sin problem. See, it's not an intellectual thing. She knows what she's doing is inconsistent. I'll give you another example. My friend, anybody, any comments so far or questions? It's kind of odd when you're just rambling, so my fault, you know. <laughs> but, but I'll say this. So my sister lives in New York City, and I love her, and she's lost. She's crazy lost. And she grew up kind of, kind of not a Christian, but she was definitely more religious than myself or my brother. And, and she, she lives in New York City, and we see her, you know, we talk to her every now and then. But she gets in some, some really hot disputes with my brother and I. My brother and I are both Christians now. Okay? Um, praise God. But whenever we're talking, she starts asking, well, we, we, you know, we can ask her, you say that so-and-so, this is evil, that, that, that Donald Trump, I mean, Donald Trump, my friends, right? I mean, look, if you want a hot topic, talk about Donald Trump. That's the easiest topic in the world to bring up, right? So, so my sister, for instance, I didn't intentionally bring it up. And for the record, I've never voted in my life because of uh, conviction. And I might, this, I might this year. And I think I will this year. But I'll say this. When you bring up Donald Trump and the unbeliever says that guy is the most awful, the evilest person, this and that, right? They all say it. Every unbeliever says it. They hate this guy. Even believers, some believers, they hate this guy, right? Whatever. But the problem is this. If I ask my sister, okay, you say that this guy is so bad, but why in your worldview is that wrong to be whatever she's calling him? She says he's a racist. I don't think so, but let's say he is, right? Well, why, according to you, is it wrong to be a racist, right? I was at the abortion clinic in El Paso, Texas. And if you know anything about El Paso... One of the controversial thing about El Paso is that supposedly they have the kids in cages. Y'all heard of that? They got kids in cages down by the border, okay? Um, it was actually started by Barack Obama, but now Trump, I, and they're not like in a zoo, you know, where they're in their own feces and things like that, okay? But when they come over and they separate the parents from the children sometimes, right? So I'm at the abortion clinic in El Paso and this lady whose daughter is inside getting an abortion because her herself, she brought her daughter to do it. She's okay with that. She comes to me and she's violently, violently, literally violently opposed to what we're doing because we're preaching outside of an abortion clinic. And there are kids, she says, down at the border who are in cages and we should be over there. And I start talking to this lady. The first thing she tells me is, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And I was like, what? You know, we're at an abortion clinic. I mean, what a weird topic to bring up. And then I say, well, and I ask her, why, do you, why does that matter? She says, well, because your president, who's, I mean, all right, right? Your president has locked kids up in cages down by the border. All right? And so I say, well, okay, are you a Christian? No, I'm an atheist. I was like, well, I got you. I mean... If you're an atheist, why is it wrong to lock kids up down on the border, right? That's all you, so, so my friends, what I'm doing, and of course she, she tries to beat around the bush. My sister does the same thing. They have no argument. And so what you have to do is expose the inconsistency of their worldview, expose the inconsistency of what they claim to believe in, show them that what you're saying to be true cannot be justified by your system of beliefs, right? And the best that we can do, see, as Christians, we turn the table and we say, on the contrary, as a Christian, I can show you why. If that is the case, that children are being harmed at the border, that's wrong. If they're being killed inside of this abortion clinic, that's wrong. If somebody's being killed in Minneapolis, Minnesota, that's wrong, right? Because I'm a Christian, I can show that, I can say that. So that's the beauty of apologetics. So my point is, my friend, you're equipped. You have everything you need. God has given us everything we need with the Word, with the Holy Spirit inside of us. He's given us everything we need. There are tools and resources that you can study to, to kind of find out about some of this. Um, do y'all run into more atheists or, or like world religions out here? Atheists? Man, that's so weird, right? When I was in Scotland, 
They say there's something like 90% of people in Scotland are atheists. And you go over there and you see it. You're like handing out tracts and stuff, you're preaching, and everybody says they're atheists. It's crazy. But then you come home and you go to a college campus and it's very similar to what you see in Scotland and England. So I think in 10 years, 20 years from now, you'll probably have the same thing as you have over there, right? And so that's why it's important to realize it's so easy to counter atheists. It's so easy to counter agnostics. And it's so easy to count, and even when it comes to like Muslims, y'all ever encounter Muslims? I love talking to Muslims. They, they're really, uh, especially if they're from the Middle East, man, I love that they're energetic, they're thick skinned, you know, you can talk to them, you're not gonna hurt anybody's feelings. And, and the thing about, the thing about the, the, let's say Islam, right? Let's say uh, Roman Catholicism, no offense if you are one, all right? Sometimes that happens, you're like, oops, okay. But here's the thing. Every worldview, okay, Uh, Mormons, no offense if you are one, (laughs) oops, okay, all of these worldviews have inconsistencies with what they claim to believe, all right? So this is kind of, I mean, if you have any questions, let me know. I'm saying this is kind of like an apologetics class, a crash course, right? So if you're talking to a, if you're talking to a Muslim and the Muslim comes out and he says, okay, wait a minute, have you ever read the Quran? Now, yes or no, you might have, you might not have, right? But if you know a few things about the Quran, know this, okay? The Quran in one area says that if you are a people of the book, then you can go to your own scriptures to find out that what the Quran says about Christianity, about about truth, about God is correct, okay? So if you know anything about Muslim, Quran, the, so anybody here know anything about Muslims? A little bit? So, so... What do they think of the Christian Bible? Uh, they think it's wrong. They think it's wrong. It's flawed. It's flawed. Yeah. But they do acknowledge that it's, it's kind of like the second installment, the second revelation, right? It, it had a season, it had its day, but then now it's like just thrown to the side, right? Okay? That's why they're saying, listen, if you go to the Gospels, what, what, do, the, what do the Muslims say about Christ? He's a prophet. He's not God. He's not a God, right? What else do they say? There it is, that that he was never crucified, okay? So now they're saying he was never crucified and he's only a man. And you can go to the Christian Gospels, according to the Quran, you can go to the Christian Gospels to find that out. And now you're like, well, I got you. And it's not about having the gotcha moments. It's about showing them they're inconsistent with what they're claiming to believe in. We want the person to be saved, right? We don't want to just win the argument. We want the person converted. But here's the thing. When I go to the Gospels, what's it say about Jesus? He died on the cross. That's obvious. All over the place, it talks about how he died. All over the place, it shows that Christ is God. Okay? So in that moment, you can say, okay, according to your Quran, it tells me to go to the Scriptures to find out that what the Quran says about Christianity is true. The Quran says that, Christian, that, that Christ was a man, not God, that Christ did not die on a cross. He was whisked away on the cross. And I go to the Gospels, and I can show you why that's false. Now, what will they say at that point? It was tainted. That's always the fallback, man. I hate that, right? Because it's like, first of all, if you look at the actual documents, if you study the manuscripts, there is plenty of evidence to show our manuscripts are not corrupted. They're not tainted. Our manuscripts, you can trust in the Bible, my friend. You can trust in God's Word. There's so many manuscripts out there that it's so easy to detect if somebody went in there and tampered with them. It'd be so easy to falsify that. But, but you can't because there's so many. Now, number two. Every, every world religion, every cult, every belief system, they will all say that because they know they don't, they don't have an argument. Any, uh, I mean, my fr- well, I don't want to pick on anybody, but let's say, there, let's say there's a Mormon out here, right? And I love talking, Mormons are very nice people. You can say that, right? Mormons are very nice. So I don't want to, I'm not bashing Mormons. I don't, you know, I'm not bashing Islam. But okay, the Mormons say the same thing, right? They say, well, we got this new installment, this new revelation. Joseph Smith, he's, a, he's the new prophet. But here's what you do with Mormons, okay? You take them to Hebrews chapter 1, and you say, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our, to our fathers by the prophets. In the old days, long ago, in the Old Testament, God did use prophets to speak to us, but that was long ago. Now the Bible says, but in these last days, which we live in, my friends, we live in the last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. 
by Jesus Christ. Okay? And we have Jesus Christ's words in the Bible. Okay? So whenever they're talking about Joseph Smith, that's an easy one. Now, do you also, my friends, do you know what Mormons teach about God? And I'm not trying to pick on Mormons. I'm just, I'm giving examples, right? I love Mormons. I do. They're, they're, they're nice. In fact, one time they offered to mow my yard, and I let them. No, I'm just kidding. I did, actually. I would have, though. I should have. If I lived in that house, I would have. They're nice. Anybody know what they say about God, though? Anybody know what they say about God? If you are a very good Mormon, and you're a male, not a female, but if you're a female in heaven, all you do is basically reproduce. You don't really... I mean, heaven's basically where you, you just pop out babies all the time, literally, just popping out babies. But if you're a male, if you are a male, my friends, and you're a Mormon, then you get to become a god... And you get to have your own universe that you, you can go and you can save like Jesus Christ saved this one. My friends, that is like the height of, of blasphemy, right? I mean, that's like some of the most, that's, that's far worse than even what Muslims teach. Because what they're saying is that there are many gods in the universe, first of all. At least Muslims just say there's one God, all right? It's the wrong God because they say Christ is not God. But my friends, what the Mormons are teaching right, is, is, is worse than what even Islam teaches. And I'm just saying that as some, I, I like Mormons. I would love to talk to them. I try to talk to them, okay? But y'all see what I'm saying? Now, to get around this, what do they say? They say, well, whenever our scriptures disagree with your scriptures, we'll just tell you, well, your scriptures are tainted in that place. That's like, that's kind of a cop-out, man, right? But that's what all of them do, my friends. That's, that's you know, that's, that's kind of where we are. But know this, again, Christ's sheep, are going to hear his voice. And we can be sure that the word of God, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So when you talk to them about Christ, you can be certain that Christ can save them, right? Whether they're Muslims, whether they're Roman Catholics, Mormons. And I want to say one thing. Let me get some water real quick. Any questions so far? You good? Okay, I got to share this one thing. Okay, so... Does anybody know what the gospel is? Right? Yeah, right? Everybody's like, well, of course we do. We know what the gospel is. But I'll tell you this. So I was saved when I was 23. And I, you know, I knew enough about the gospel to be saved. I read the Bible. You know, the scriptures converted me, basically. I think it was more scripture than anything else, just reading through it. But then I was around 26. And someone sent me a CD. And some guy preaching... There was a guy preaching on this CD, and his name was Paul Washer. Anybody heard of Paul Washer? Paul Washer? Anybody? All right. So if you haven't heard of Paul Washer, I'm serious. Every time you listen to this guy, you'll get converted. And I, I believe you can only be converted once. But this guy, okay, God uses this guy in a mighty way. But when I heard this guy, because what he did is this. He articulated what it meant for Christ to go to the cross. So, for instance, when you hear about, like, around Easter time, okay, and everybody talks about Christ's suffering. We all know that Christ suffered, right? But why is it in the garden? Here's the question, my friends, and, and somebody answer this. In the garden, when Christ is saying, Father, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me, right? Why is he in the garden saying that? What is in the cup that he is so terrified of? Man. Isn't that right? Here, here's, here's the usual thing that you hear, right? Jesus Christ is afraid of being beaten and flogged and whipped, and he's afraid of the nine-inch nails being driven through his... They drive, drive the nails through their wrist right here. It wasn't through the palm. It was through that bone right here. And that would, that would give you enough support to hang on a cross. And so the, the common idea is that, well, Christ is so afraid of this kind of horrific physical death that he's crying out, God, let this cup pass from me. Of course, in the end, he says, not my will be done, but your will. But here's the thing, okay? So that's me as a, as a and I'm like, but then, I, then, then someone points out to me, listen, there have been thousands of Christians who were crucified on that same cross that went to their death singing hymns to God, that they had no fear. They didn't have any trepidation. They weren't afraid of the cross. They were, they, were, they, were, they were loving the fact that they were worthy enough to die. They weren't afraid of it. So how could it be that Christ was afraid of this cross that all of these martyrs were not afraid of? Right? And you're like, ah, okay, I see that. Wow, right? 
So what was in that cup? It cannot be the physical sufferings alone. Because even Christ says, don't fear man who can kill the body. But he says, fear who? Fear God. Because God has the power to cast both body and soul into hell. Right? And so when Christ is talking in the garden and he's saying, God, let this cup pass from me. He's talking about the wrath of God. He's talking about the fact that on the following day, he knows that he's going to go to the cross and the wrath of God is going to crush him in place of all, all the sinners, you know, everyone who calls upon his name. So Christ is knowing that tomorrow morning, I'm going to be crushed by this God. Now think about Christ. There was never a moment in Christ's life from all eternity when he was actually separated from God, when he was actually displeasing to God. Not a single moment in all of eternity. You and I have had that moment where we have made God un, un, displeased with us. We've made God angry with us, right? Christ never had that. He never did that. And so when Christ goes to the cross, and you see this, anybody ever read Isaiah 53? Everybody, anybody? You ever read this, this passage to a Jewish man or Jewish woman? They, they, my friends, if you, they don't, you got to do it, right? It's like, look, this is 800 years before Jesus Christ came to earth. And it says he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. But look what it said. It says it was the will of the Lord to crush him, right? The father crushes the son. The father crushes the son. The wrath of God falls upon Jesus Christ because Christ is bearing our sin. He's bearing our curse. And, and when you're talking to a Muslim and you're asking a Muslim, well, who do you think God is? And they'll tell you, Allah is both merciful and just. They ever tell you that? Allah is both merciful and just. And you say, well, if he's just, who pays for your sin then? Because a good judge, there has to be a payment for sin. A good judge cannot simply overlook sin, otherwise he's a corrupt judge. A good judge cannot be bribed with your good works, otherwise he's a corrupt judge. So who pays for your sin? You see what I mean? And when you tell him that, they'll say, well, he's merciful, so he just forgives us. You say, okay, he's merciful, but he's no longer just. See, the Christian God is both merciful and just. The justice of God is satisfied in Jesus Christ when he's crushed on the cross. My sins have been paid for by Jesus Christ in full. Now, the next part of this is, you know, if you're talking to a Roman Catholic, they'll ask you, okay? Because I tell a Roman Catholic, look, my sins have been forgiven. Every single one of them. The ones I'll commit tonight, the ones I'll commit tomorrow, the ones I'll commit a week from now. And they'll ask you, they'll say, well, wait a minute. If that's the case, why do you try to live a moral life then? If you're telling me that all your sins have been paid for, why don't you go and cheat on your wife? Why don't you go to the bar and get drunk? Why do you, you know, why, what keeps you from sinning? And what do you tell them? I mean, that's an easy one, right? What, what do you say? I, it's my love for Christ. It's the fact that I have the Holy Spirit in me. It's the fact that I've been born again. I'm a new creation, so I hate the sin I once loved. I mean, that is so simple, right? And that shows you, my friends, if you don't have a, a full understanding of what it means to be converted, you're living the life that, I mean, in a sense, you, you were never meant to live. I mean, Christ has died on the cross for us to be able to recognize that I don't have to go around flogging myself. I don't have to go around walking across glass, you know, saying 25,000 prayers just to be forgiven. But I do fear God, right? As a Christian, I still fear God and I still hate sin. But I love God and I love, I love the fact that God in his mercy has died on the cross for my sins. And he tells us to repent and believe the gospel. Which comes first, by the way, my friends? Repentance or, or belief? Which comes first? Y'all ever wonder that? You know, because when, when somebody says, what must I do to be saved? Is that what y'all, that's what I tell them. You have to repent and believe. Is that what y'all say? Anything else? I mean, what's up, Jace? So which comes first, repentance or, or, or belief? I don't mean it, you know, faith. I like, I like that, you know, and, and that's why. So, so, okay. So what comes first? Salvation or faith? Salvation comes before faith. Faith leads to salvation. I would definitely say that. Where does, where does faith come from? 
Where does faith come? Is it, here's the, and I don't mean it. So in other words, is faith something that comes from within me or does it come from outside of me? Is it something that's given to me? And I'm not trying to stump y'all. It's not about, you know, making... I know it's, it's a hard question, right? But I would say this. Because of what the Bible teaches about man. So in other words, what I'm reading again, there is none righteous, no, not one. Which is great, right? Because everybody in our culture says, well, I'm a, I'm, I, I'm a pretty good person. And if somebody tells you, hey, I'm a good person, just ask them how many times they've told a lie in their life. I, I've, somebody out here yesterday, one of the pagan groups, she said she was agnostic. And I said, who holds you accountable for sin? She said, I hold myself accountable for sin. Right? Now, how convenient is that? Now, how cool, it was, you know, and I asked her, so how many times have you told a lie? Well, a lot of lies. And you're still holding yourself accountable for sin. Yes. Well, then you're not doing a very good job of it if you're continuing to do it. Right? But the unbeliever, my friends, will try to do anything they can to get out of what God tells us to do. Okay, which is to repent and believe in Christ. That God commands all persons everywhere to repent, to believe in Christ. But look what it says. It says, there is none righteous, no, not one. No one, there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks for God. Now, honestly, has, have, has anybody read that honestly? You've read that, right? And if you actually think through what that means, nobody seeks for God. Nobody out here that's an unbeliever is right now seeking for God. Now that, my friends, I don't know about y'all, but that flies in the face of a lot of the Christianity that I, I guess, grew up around, right? Because the idea, the notion is usually, well, they really want God, they just don't know they want God, right? They're kind of like in this, in, this, in this middle zone where as long as you come and you do something, then they'll like God, right? But this is saying they don't, they don't seek for God, okay? So if you're reading these things, I mean, it goes on and on. There's no one who does good, no, not one. This is why I believe, same thing with, uh, you know, where the Bible says that in sin my mother conceived me from the time I came out of my mother's womb. I went astray, I was speaking lies. Anybody have children out here? Nobody have kids? So I'm, I'm 35 now, I have, I have one child. And uh, I was kind of older later in life, you know, when I had a kid. I tell you this, you realize very quickly that this child has the Adamic nature. This child, and I love the child, man, he's so cute. I mean, I, you know, he's like the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. But this guy is like tainted with some serious sin and serious selfishness. And he, he goes his own way. He speaks lie already. He's like one years old, right? And so, and the reality is, is that's how we're born. Nobody teaches us. This is how we're born, right? Like Job says again, we drink down sin like it was water, okay? This is why I believe that faith is a gift that comes from God. It's a gift that comes from God. When a person has this, when, the, when God gives them this, this gift. Now, how does God give it to them? Well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ or God. So it comes through someone sharing Christ with someone else. So God uses us to go out into the world and to share the gospel. And as we're doing that, people are being converted because God is giving them that gift of faith. So that's why I believe that faith is something that comes from God. It's a gift from God. And, I, you know, the Bible teaches that. Um, and of course, we're saved not by our works, we're saved by our faith, okay? We're saved by faith alone, but what the Bible shows is that repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. And the problem is, is nobody uses coins anymore. So you probably don't understand that illustration. I mean, it's not like, it's kind of different. You know, two sides of the same credit card. That's what we should say, because it is, right? So you have faith and repentance, they happen at the same time. Repentance, what's repentance? It's a turning. That's literally what it means. It means you're walking one way, you stop, you turn, you go the other way. It's a turning. What's, there's another word, there's another meaning for it. Anybody know? Metanoia in the Greek, it means a change of mind. Yeah. So you have a change of mind about what? What, what does your mind change about? Sin. Did y'all say sin? Yeah, I thought so. I thought, sorry with the mask. So sin, your mind changes about sin, right? You go from loving sin, being enslaved to sin, to hating sin. You turn from sin. But your mind also changes about God. You go from hating God, you go from not liking God, from not desiring God, not seeking God, to now all of a sudden you do a 180 and you are seeking God. So your mind changes, right? And, and so that's repentance. But the reason you repent is because you have faith now. Y'all see what I'm saying? So it's not like one leads to the other. They happen at the same time. Because I have faith, I repent. Because I repent, therefore I have faith. 
because I turned from sin to God. Right? Does that make sense? So it's a, it's a and I'm bringing this out because, you know, when I was in college, I didn't know any of this, man. You guys are head and shoulders above me where I was. Um, anybody ever want to be a, a preacher like this, by the way, someday? Or are you already? <laughs> not ready. Not, you're, not, you're not doing it yet? Not yet. But you want to be. Yeah. Praise God, man. I love it. You know, God is, God is raising up like an army, man, of people coming out and preaching. Uh, and there's different ways to do it. You know, I know that you guys probably see a lot of crazy stuff happen when guys come and preach. All right. I, 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 I've never, <laughs> I don't know. I don't have it in me to, to go about it in certain ways, right? I just try to, I try to talk about the Bible and certain things. Uh, how are you, ma'am? Is your name Melissa? Oh, I saw you yesterday. Welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's a, I don't know if we're all Christians here or what, but I'm just, it seems like we are. I'm preaching like we are. So it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm sure a lot of y'all know her. She's a nice lady. She's out here yesterday. We're talking about repentance and faith. How same thing. Yeah. Two sides of the same coin. Um, but yeah, when I was so, so when I, the first day on campus for me, when the first day I, I went to a college in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the very first day I stepped foot on, a, on, on that campus, I saw a guy preaching and he had a Bible and he was just, it, he had like a little crowd, not a little, I mean, it was probably like this, but they're bunched together and they're like, they're throwing stuff and hating on him, you know, and what usually happens. I mean, this is like the mellowest I've ever seen anybody in my life. This is, it's crazy. I, I'm like stunned. I don't know. I don't know how to react, right? I'm used to like people yelling and stuff. So that being the case, when I saw that guy doing that, and I was only a believer for like a year before then, there was something in me, man, that was like, I've got to do that. And it took me about uh, six years before I actually did it. But for six years, in my mind, I was thinking, man, I've, I've got to go do that. And I tell you, once you do it, man, you'll love it. If the Lord's calling you to it, it's really cool. You'll have some days, nobody stopped. You'll have some days, you get... This is my first day like this. But you'll have some days, you know, people want to kill you and you just love it. You know, it's like, this is not that you intentionally, see my friends, I don't intentionally try to provoke people. I'm not that kind of preacher. I'm not intentionally trying to like, I don't, I'm not going to call people names, you know. Um, I know some people, that's kind of their method. That's not, I, my method is I try to trust in the power of God, the Holy Spirit to draw who he wants to draw. If he wants to draw nobody, hey, that's him humbling me. You know, I mean, that's, that's how it goes. But if he draws other I mean, God always, he does stuff. So that's encouraging, my man. Anybody else want to be a preacher one day? Talk to me after this, man. Let's talk, man. That's cool. I, I always love, I'm telling you, there is like a surge of people like going around and preaching and, and some of them have good, most of them, a lot of them have good theology. They're not like the Pelagians that come on y'all's campus, you know? The, I'm telling you, man, those guys are something. Uh, any, any questions, any other questions though? So I got something else I want to talk about, if not. No, no questions? This guy, it's good to see you back out here, man. Yeah. Okay, so let's, okay. Usually I don't, I don't even say it, but I got a Bible. I'm sure y'all have a Bible in your backpack or whatnot, on your phone, right? But if I turn in the Bible and I'm looking for passages, okay? I'm looking for passages because I want to talk about something that you're not really supposed to talk about on a college campus, okay? Now, homosexuality. Right? And I know it's not the gospel. I don't use it as the gospel. I'm not saying it is. But I'm saying that in the environment that you're in, you know as Christians it's going to be brought up. That's something that people want to know about. They want to talk about it. Okay? So if you have a Bible and somebody were to ask you, what do you think about homosexuals? What in the world do you tell them? That's the question. Right? What do you tell them? You got, you got a few ways to go about it, but what do you say? Has anybody been in that situation? Has anybody not been in that situation? Right? Maybe we all have, right? Well, it, it'll happen. It'll come up. You know, if you, because the, the mentality, see what's going on in our culture today is this. If you say homosexuality is wrong, you are a bigot, you're unloving, you hate everybody, this and that. Okay? The problem is this. We don't live in a Christian culture. And that's a good thing, I think, in a lot of ways. I wish it was Christian, but in another way it can be a good thing. Because it, it makes us go back to God's word and try to say, okay, what's going on here? Okay? So my friends, first of all, don't be led astray by the culture. Right? We have to stand on God's word and what he says about the topic, not what our culture says. Our culture drifts. 
You, especially y'all, man. You, I tell you, in 10 years, I promise you, and I'm not a prophet. I'm not saying I, I have some kind of super revelation or whatever. But you guys know, man, y'all see the drift of things. I can almost guarantee you in 10 years, there's going to be people who will be maybe dying because they're Christians. Especially thrown in jail. I've been thrown in jail plenty of times for preaching. And, and it's, it's, it's not like every time you go out. Obviously, I'm able to come here and preach, right? But 10 years, y'all know how it'll be. And in 20 years, 30 years, for sure, man, you guys, y'all's generation, and, and I guess, I don't know if we're the same generation or not. I don't know. I think I'm a, uh, I'm a millennial, actually. I don't know. I don't think y'all are, right? Most of you are. Right. So I'm, I'm actually a millennial. But your generation, maybe my generation, you're going to be, it's going to be some fire that comes to us, right? But, but the Bible everywhere talks about how we can consider it all joy whenever we face trials like that. The whole New Testament is filled with people losing their lives, being killed for that, going to jail for that faith. And we can rejoice in this, right? But here's the thing. You know who, do you know who it is who will be persecuted? It's going to be those who say, I'm going to stand on what God says. What's up, my man? Amen. Yes. The, yeah, let us rejoice and be glad in it, right? So Romans chapter one, this is what you do, okay? It's not just the Old Testament. Okay, that's what you got to realize first. It's not just the Old Testament that talks. In fact, the New Testament brings it up far more often. Than the, in the Old Testament, there's only like two references. In the New Testament, when you look at Romans 1, you guys ever read Romans 1? Right? You see it there. Um, so you can go there. It talks about how women, you know, they had lust for other women. Then men, they did the same thing, so God gave them over. My favorite place to go to, and I, I, think, I think it's a place that, that would be helpful because... It's, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Because in 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul explicitly mentions homosexuals. But what he does is he he's talking about it in the context of there were people in this church at Corinth who used to be homosexuals. But now they've been forgiven. They've been washed. They've been cleansed. So when you bring this chapter up, it's very easy to go from homosexuality to go to, but, but you can be saved. Now, I think it was like two weeks ago, I was in El Paso still, and at the abortion clinic, there was a group that came up, and they said that. They were talking about abortion, and we're, you know, shooting down the arguments, and then they said, well, what do you think of homosexuals? And I said, well, I hope they get saved. And they said, oh, so you're saying there's something wrong with them because they need to be saved, right? So it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> there is, right? They're in rebellion against God. But, see, here's the, here's the problem. They're assuming that they can interpret reality in the right way. They're assuming that their view of the world is correct when it's not. Their, their view of reality is not. See, what they're not doing is they are, they're forgetting that they did not create themselves. They're living in a model of, of uh, macro Darwinian evolution, which assumes that there's no higher authority over us, that you can basically do whatever you want. But whenever you talk about a creator, and this is what I would do with homosexuality, when you talk about a creator, what you're starting out with is we have to play by God's rules. This universe belongs to God. It's not something that belongs to us. This universe is God's. He has put us in this universe that belongs to him. We are called to be representatives of God. That's partly what it means to be made in his image. And because we're made in God's image, we have a responsibility to live in a certain way that God commands us to, to live in, right? What do y'all say? Um, I asked one of the guys earlier. No, I think it was Jace, somebody. I think it was Jace, the guy that walked by. But what do y'all say the purpose of life is? What do you think the purpose of life is? What's that? To know God, to be friends with God. Amen. You know, the greatest summation of it I've ever heard is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Right? And that's what you're saying. To glorify God and to enjoy God. That's kind of what you're saying. To be friends. Right? So that is the purpose of life for everybody. And if you're not living in that way, then you've missed the mark. You're not going to be comfortable. You're not going to be at peace. You're not going to have satisfaction. You can have bits of happiness or whatever, but it's always creaturely happiness that changes, that comes and goes, right? It, you, you, I mean, it's like, the, it's like when the Bible talks about you're, you're like a boat in the middle of a sea and you go this way, you go that way. That's how, that's how the unbeliever is, right? But when you're a believer and you have God's word, we're not like that. But here's the thing. Even the unbeliever is called to live for the glory of God. They're called to enjoy God. Now, they don't, right? But again, the problem is, is that they are looking at a person's homosexuality from the lens of macro-Darwinian evolution. And they are assuming that because there's no higher authority over me, therefore I can do what I want with my body when that body does not belong to them. 
right? Even in the abortion context where you're saying, well, you're killing a person, you're not killing yourself. You can also say it when you're talking about homosexuality. Because you are, I mean, what are we called to do with our body? Glorify God with our bodies, right? So we're called to live for God with our bodies. So, and that goes for the unbeliever or the believer. So that's what, you know, obviously I'm assuming that you'll be able to talk to people in a rational way about this. But just know this, my friends. See, when you start saying this stuff, when you make this stand, there will be a tide against you. And you are going to be seen as the scum of the earth. And I'll give you an example. Okay, y'all heard of Hillary Clinton, obviously. Does Hillary Clinton say that she's a Christian? Y'all know? Anybody out here? Does anybody follow Hillary Clinton? I know she was like four years ago and all that. <laughs> Old news. But something struck me about that lady that's very malicious, among other things, right? There's a few things. But my friends, Hillary Clinton says that she's a Christian. Now, Donald Trump says he's a Christian, and I don't buy it, right? I don't, I don't think so. But here's what they're doing, right? They play the religion card. But here's the thing about Trump and about Clinton and about a lot of other Christ, so-called Christians out there, okay? They'll say with their mouth they're Christian, but it says in Titus 1.16, by their works, by the way they live, they deny him. And I'm not talking about sinless perfectionism. I don't believe in that. But what I'm saying, right, Christ himself says you know him by your fruit. So I can look at Donald Trump. I can look at Hillary Clinton. And it's pretty obvious, yeah, you're not, I don't, <laughs> it doesn't seem like you're a Christian, okay? But here's the thing, the world will love the Hillary Clinton type of Christianity, the Joe Biden type of Christianity. The Christianity says, well, I'm a Christian, but God is totally okay with homosexuality. I'm a Christian, but God is totally cool with abortion. Y'all see what I'm saying? That's the type of Christianity that the culture loves, the world loves, but it's not true Christianity. It does not correlate with the Bible. It doesn't correspond with God's word. Now, I'm not saying you got to hate a homosexual, right? I'm saying we should love them and talk to them about the gospel. Tell them to repent and believe in Christ, right? Because we used to be as bad as they are, maybe different sin. But I am saying, my friends, when the persecution comes against you, it's so easy. Isn't it? It's, it's really easy to kind of just to kind of retreat and say, yeah, but you know, maybe God's cool with the homosexuals, right? Not according to the God's, I mean, that's an obvious one, right? There's some gray areas in scripture, but that's not one of them. And so, um, you know, when people bring in certain, well, it's, it's just the cultural context. It's like, no, not that one, man. I mean, some of this is, but you can tell this is a theological statement that applies for all time on that one, right? It's kind of like, well, I got other examples of that, but any other questions on that part? Homosexuality, abortion, Evolution. Evolution. That's a. Anybody take a, a, a science class yet? I guess that's what statement like. Oh yeah. Uh, I guess capital punishment. Like you see capital punishment. Uh, Try and speak for. That's a good one. <laughs> Two different sides of political parties. One side encourages capital punishment, punishment but doesn't support abortion. And then you go on the other end and you put on the other Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are yeah. you from England? I love England. That's my favorite country in the world. I love England. What, what part of England? North London. Okay, that's nice. Yeah, I preach in England a, a, a lot. I got a lot of friends in England who preach over there. I love it. England's great, especially in the summertime, right? Yeah. But so, yeah, so, so, so that's, so y'all hear what she's saying? But see, that shows the hypocrisy, right? And that's why, look, my friends, you know, there's another type of Christianity right there that I think is a really good thing to bring up, okay? You know, there's like a, a, a Republican type of Christianity, you know, like a guns and Bible kind of Christianity. Um, I mean, I don't know, look, some, <laughs> that's a hard topic, right? Because the thing is, is obviously the Republicans support certain things that Christians would agree with. And, and there are Republicans who are Christians and vice versa. In fact, there's a lot of them, right? I mean, I'm not saying that's wrong, but she's pointing something out. Even if a political party becomes inconsistent with your beliefs as a Christian, you should ditch the party and not your beliefs in Christianity, not your, not your, your faith in God, not your commitment to God. 
right? So if, if I, and that's a great point. And in fact, you see that even with like, um, um, I don't know, like, like uh, what, what used to be a big thing? So for instance, like um, immigration, thank you. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Because with immigration, okay, immigration is a very biblical thing to accept the foreigner, to bring it, to welcome the foreigner, to provide for the foreigner. Now there should be limits and rules and things like that. However, I think sometimes, you know, Republicans can come so hard down on that issue that it's like, well, it does kind of sound like, you know, that you hate all immigrants. And that's unbiblical, right? And I know most of them would deny that. Most of them would say, no, we just want it to be, and I'm not trying to be political here, but she brought up a very good point. Because if anything you're following becomes inconsistent with that thing, like uh, like education. When I was going to college, I really, really, I mean, I really dreamed of being like, uh, my goal was to be a philosophy professor. And it was like, well, in order to do that, I mean, you kind of have to compromise in some certain things, in certain areas. Uh, and I was just, for me, my conscience, I just couldn't do it, right? I mean, I really wanted to. And my friends, as a Christian in your culture and in your context, you're going to have to face that. There'll be certain job opportunities you will not be able to have because it's going, it's going to conflict with your commitment to your, your belief in Christ. There's going to be certain religious, I mean, uh, political situations that you'll be in and you can't, you just can't do it because of your belief in Christ. That's personally why I, I have never voted in my life because I just haven't been able to like fully support. And I'm not saying it's wrong to vote. I'm not saying that. I'm saying my, my, I'm not saying it's a sin at this point to vote, you know. But what if you had a choice between Adolf Hitler and Adolf Hitler? Who do you vote for? And I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that that's what this is. We're not even close to that. But that, in a sense, is what it's leading to. You know, when even the, the so-called conservative party, and this is, not, this is not politics, it is and it's not. You know, whenever, whenever even the, the conservative party stops um, being fully supportive of, like, let's say, end abortion, you know, they say it with their mouth. Donald Trump is not fully behind ending abortion, though. You can tell, right? He's not. That's not one of his things. He's not. And I'll give you another example, my friends. I Look, what is Donald Trump's stance on homosexuals? Anybody know? He supports them, man. He celebrates the, the, you know, the Pride Month, right? So that's a great example. So right there, you have a situation. I'm not... Should, here's a question for y'all, as, 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 as Christians, professing Christians. Should the president, the governor, the politicians, should they be required to hold Christian principles in order to be elected or to serve, etc.? You don't think so? Anybody? Does anybody think they should? Usually we say, no, they shouldn't, right? Um, I don't know, man. Here's, here's what we know. Romans 13 says God is the one who ordains every single person to that place. Right, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Obama, right? God is the one who ordains certain people to hold that office. And we're called to respect that office, to pray for them, to, to show reverence to them, you know, not to bow down to them, but to, to give them respect, etc. right? However, what happens when the rulers become evil? What happens when the rulers become evil? As Christ, I'm talking to Christians, right? At that point, I, I believe that we are called to make a stand. We see that in the scriptures, right? So in, in the Bible, do y'all have you, anybody read the book of Acts? Okay, in the book of Acts, what do you have? You have them saying, do not go and talk about this man, Jesus Christ. Don't, you're not allowed to do that. And what do they do? We have to obey God and not man at that point. Now, so say you're in a situation and it's going to happen in America, right? Where they say, you can no longer evangelize. You have to stick, keep everything to the church. You're not allowed, like even in, in England, man, those are, we go to England and my friends, when we preach, if somebody, all they have to do over there is call and say, hey, I, I heard this guy say something about homosexuals. That's demeaning. Even if it's a lie and the police come and they'll throw you in jail and then they'll sort it out. It's a, it's a tough place when it comes to that. It's a great place to preach. I love it. But here's the thing, America will be like that soon, okay? So at that, at that, if, if you're in that situation, and I'm just challenging you to, to think about this before you get into it, because my friends, the worst thing you can do is to be in the situation without even thinking about, well, how should I respond, right? So when you're in that situation, 
And they tell you, if you proselytize, if you say something about Christ outside of the church, you're going to be fined $500, you're going to be thrown in jail, whatever. If you say something at work, you're going to lose your job. What do you do as a Christian? What should we do? I mean, do we say, well, we have to, we have to submit because Romans 13 tells us to. I would say no, right? Because at that point, we have to obey God. God has told us to go into all the world and make disciples. God has told us to go and open our mouths about Christ, to evangelize, right? And you're telling me I can't evangelize, therefore, I have to obey God. I can't obey man at this point. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm not, you know, it's funny because in a sense, I mean, is, is anybody out here not a believer, by the way? <laughs> Just so I know, because it matters. You know, if you're talking to Christians, it matters. Which is fine. That's totally fine. It's, it's, it's a really, uh, it's quite a refreshing situation right now. I don't know what to think in a, in a good way. Right, it's crazy, right? It's like, yeah, night and day different. Yeah. So let me ask you a question, okay? You're the guy that wanted to preach. So come here for just a second. I'm not going to get, you don't have to preach. What's your name, man? Eh? Jamin. Jamin? Yeah. Hey, I'm Ryan. Nice to meet you. Nice Chris. to meet you, Jamin. Yeah, sometimes it just helps. Just what you, if you don't mind, you mind just holding the sign for a little while? That'll, that'll kind of just get you from this perspective able to, you know, yeah. kind of see how, how it goes and things like that. <laughs> Good things like that, you know what I mean? This is Jamin. Hey, Callie. Hey, Yeah, Jamin's, Jamin's the man, huh? So, so my friends, uh, any questions for Jamin? Just kind of help him out. Why don't we ask Jamin? Uh, so Jamin, uh, we're not putting Jamin on the spot, right? We're not putting him on the spot or anything. But I do want to ask Jamin. I want to ask him. So if somebody comes up, Jamin, yeah. and they're talking about, let's say racism, right? Racism's the big issue, okay? Now, Jamin, if somebody came up to you and said, basically, you know, Christians... Christians are in support of slavery. How would you answer that? I would say fundamentally, we are. We believe that every person is made in the image of God. That's great, right? Every every person is made in God's image, right? And that's that's in Genesis one. So he's he's right on, right? So how can if if you're looking at Genesis one and it says every person is made in God's image? Right. At what point can Christianity or the Bible become racist? I mean, that's just pretty much as non-racist as you get. Right. But that being the hot topic, what about slavery, Jamie? If somebody were to say, well, there doesn't, doesn't the Bible support slavery? No, no, no. He says, no, that's right. Yeah. And, and you know why? OK, so so does the Bible support slavery? Anybody? Has anybody read about slavery in the Bible? It's there, right? Yeah, yeah. It's content. It's, it does say, right? It does say submit to your masters in Ephesians 6 and other places too. So it does talk about slavery. But here's the thing, okay? What kind of slavery was taking place in that context? It's, okay, you know what, what they did in, in America, right? They, they, they basically stole people from Africa. They stole people, right? Those people were stolen. And, and the Bible condemns man stealing. Y'all have read that? It condemns, the Bible explicitly says you can't, you can't steal people. Condemns man stealing. So in other words, the kind of slavery that was built in America, unfortunately, and in the West, other places, that was built upon the notion of man stealing, which the Bible condemns. Okay? But in the, in the New Testament especially, and in the Old Testament, that kind of slavery, another thing to point out, is that the slavery was certainly not based upon the person's nationality or, or skin color. Okay, so in other words, that, that in itself is different from the, the slavery in America, right? It's not based on skin color. It's ba basically they were, they were either slaves because um, um, they were captured in war. Okay, so, so in other words, one side fights the other side, and instead of killing them, they graciously say, well, you just have to work for us. Or secondly, it's called ind indentured servanthood, servitude. Where you would basically, it's kind of like what we have in our culture when you have a job, but you would actually live with that person. Because it wasn't as, it wasn't as urbanized in most areas as our areas are today. 
So you'd basically live with the people. You wouldn't get paid for it. You would live. Um, they would feed you. And, and in fact, I mean, you need to, even in the scriptures, even when it comes to those servants, you're called to, serve, to, to hand, treat them in a nice way, to respect them in a nice way. So in other words, what you had in America was completely opposite of that. And that's why, who was it? And this is important. Who was it who actually rose up against slavery in the 1800s and even in the 1700s? They were Christians. The Christians were the ones that rose up and said, this is really wrong. And they could use the Bible to say it. Now, I understand that a lot of times people say, well, the other side used the Bible too. Okay? But in reality, when you look at both sides and how they're reading the Bible, only one side was interpreting the Bible in the right way with the right context. The other, the other side was very clearly taking it out of, out of, out of context. Right? So, that's, that's a big issue. But here's the point, though. When you're talking in this way with an unbeliever, right, you, you want to point it back to the gospel. Right, Jay, right. You want to get it back to the gospel. So the way you get it back to the gospel, I would say, I'm not like a guru necessarily, but the way you do that is to point out, like we've been saying, well, in contrast, what do you believe? Do you believe in God? If they say yes, and they're not a Christian, then you want to say, well, what kind of God do you believe in, right? What kind of religion are you, are you following? And then go from there. I mean, if they say, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I mean, I don't know of a religion that would condemn Christi Christianity based on their views of slavery because most, most religions come out of the Judeo-Christian background, right? Um, I don't know, maybe Buddhism, right? So if you're talking to a Buddhist and they want to say, well, Christians think this, well, it's very simple to just point out their, their own morality and say, well, what do Buddhists... Has anybody out here ever met a Buddhist, by the way? Y'all met Buddhists? Anybody out here practicing Buddhist? Has anybody out here ever met a Christian Buddhist? You met somebody that said that? I'm telling you, they're out there, right? They actually say that. Now, what did you say to that when they said that? I said, that doesn't make no sense. That doesn't make no sense, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'd say too, right? And what do they say? They said that um, you're entitled to your own opinion. That's how it goes, right, sometimes? Yeah. But, uh... You know, the thing about Buddhists is that if you're talking to them, they have no, they, they have no basis of morals. They have no real basis for morality. You know, they, there's, there's the, the one, and, and we're all kind of part of that one, right? And so in that system, how, how do you have morals in that system? And you really don't. So in other words, you can ask the Buddhists, well, why do you say slavery is wrong? I can tell you why. I just told you why, right? You shouldn't man still. Everybody's creating God's image. They're all equal. You know, you shouldn't condemn somebody, especially based on their skin color. But according to Buddhists, why do you believe that? You see what I mean? So you just flip the table on them. You just flip the table and say, okay, what do you say about that? After you've explained your side. Or sometimes it's the other way around where they explain theirs and then you explain yours. Whatever, right? But that's, that's the point. So you just expose their inconsistencies in contrast to Christianity's consistencies on any topic. Man, it's so nice to be a Christian. It is so, in a sense, when it comes to like apologetics and talking to the lost and evangelizing, you know, in a sense... It's, it's, I, I don't want to say easy because we need the Holy Spirit to do it. But man, you are equipped. Seriously, literally, you're equipped with everything you need with the Bible and a little logic. And logic comes from God. So you're using all of God's tools right there, right? So, you know, and it helps to know a little about what they say. So, I don't know, man. You want to you wanna give your testimony or anything? Is anybody a freshman, by the way? You're a freshman? All right, where are you from? Houston. All right. I was, I've been preaching in Houston. I love it. I love Houston. Yeah, that's cool. So do you know anybody here? All right. Wait, what's your name? Gabrielle. Gabrielle. So my friend, this is Gabrielle. She's a Christian. She's a freshman. And she's, you know, talk to her when you see her in class. Say hi to her. It's nice to know other Christians are out there, right? Yeah, this is good. Anybody else a freshman? No kidding, really. Well, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, you're the only freshman. Yeah. How are you all today? Yeah, we're just talking about truth. Now, how do you define truth? Um, facts. Like facts. Facts, yeah. Facts are truth, right? Right? Any fact is true. Facts, by definition, have to be true. Right? That's good. Any, anybody else? How do, you, how, do you, how do you define truth? 
There's one truth. That's a that's the way to start, right? Because how many times do people say your truth is your truth? That's what the pagans started out saying yesterday. So we had a lot of hecklers, and they're by 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 uh, self-professing pagans, right? They they were saying that my truth is my truth, your truth is your truth. Okay. Now, if my tr how do you, what do you say to that? What do you say to that? And like she said, there's one truth. Okay. Here's here. You know what a good way to say that is. Okay. So when they say there's no such thing as objective truth, y'all know the difference between objective and subjective truth? Right, so subjective truth is more like that. Like everyone has their own truth and it does, there's no like outside truth that, that our truth has to conform to, right? That would be objective truth. But when they say, it's, it's so great, it's so, and I didn't, I didn't make this up, it's, it's so great. When they say there's no such thing as subjective truth, is that not an objective truth claim, right? That in itself is an objective truth claim to say there's no such thing as objective truth. All right, y'all get that? So it's very easy. It's, it's called a self-refuting argument. And they, they're, you know, unbelievers have to fall into that because they don't have anything else to stand on. Okay? But whenever, see, whenever they turn the table, they say, well, what's truth to you? Okay? Now, as a Christian, what's great about truth is that Christianity alone can provide an actual basis for where you get truth and why you have truth, okay? Truth, very simply, is that which conforms to reality, right? That which conforms to reality is true, okay? But here's, here's the next step. Reality has been defined by God. That's the, that's the key step. So in other words, it's not just that which conforms to reality and is out there, right? Truth is that which conforms to reality. Reality has been dictated, defined by God, established by God. In other words, okay, has anybody ever been asked by God what color we want the sky to be today, right? Or what color we want grass to be? I mean, did God, and of course, now I'm saying it rhetorically, where, where God doesn't ask us, hey, do you want the grass to be blue or yellow or, or, or white or purple? No, right? We come into this world and there are already truths that are governing this world. These truths come from God, right? These truths do not come from our own reasoning. We come into this universe and we're already using the laws of logic like we talked about earlier in order to, to identify certain things about the world we live in. That is something that God himself has established. And, and talking about this, my friends, you know what's great too? Have y'all have ever heard of the word of providence, providence or sovereignty? You know, the beautiful thing is, is that God is sovereign. God is a God of sovereignty. God is a God of providence, which means, for instance, okay, none of us here got to choose what city we were born in, what parents we were born to, uh, what color of skin we had, um, you know, what's some other things. I mean, what our parents did for a living, you know, whether we're, 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 we're born into a, a billionaire family or whatever, right? Superstars, celebrities. God never asks us that. And that's called God's providence. We come into this world and, and we these things are already here. Same thing, when God created Adam, the same situation arose. God didn't ask Adam before he created Adam, hey Adam, is that okay if I make you and I put you in this garden? He just did it. That's God's sovereignty. That's God's, that is God's providence to do that. Okay? He didn't ask Adam. He didn't even ask Adam. The only thing he asked Adam is, is uh, hey, Adam, go ahead and name animals. You know, you can name some stuff, name whatever you want. But, but he didn't say, hey, Adam, um, you know, what color should the sky be? Hey, Adam, what are we going to do about, you know, the way you think and the way you talk? But I'll tell you what's really neat, my friends, is that right away God communicates with us. See, God is a God of communication. Even before God created, do you think God was lonely before he created the universe? No, right? Right? And you know why he wasn't lonely? Because there's three persons. That's right. He had the Trinity. There was, there was communication and love and, and personhood before there was a single person created. Now, from all of eternity, God has been communicating. That's why we can look at the Bible and we can trust that this is God's word because God is a God who communicates. God is a God who speaks in a language that we can understand, right? He doesn't speak in, in, in yeah, what's up, my man? He doesn't speak in the, the language of angels, right? He speaks in the language of humans so that we can understand him. That's why we can trust in God's word. That's why we can stand on God's word today. Does that make sense? So in, in other words, two plus two equals four. That is not a concept that man invented. 
That's not a concept that man came up with. Why? Because if that was the case, at what point does man begin saying that? Have y'all ever read Charles Darwin, by the way? Anybody read anything about by Charles Darwin? Nothing? Nothing by Charles Darwin? Kind of? A little bit? You know, it's, it's funny. So in the, in the very first book, or not his first book, but, but in, the, in the most popular book called The Origin of Species, anybody, we've all heard of that book, right? The Origin of Species. So in The Origin of Species, the full title of that says something about how, says something like, like to the effect of the supremacy of certain races. Charles Darwin was a racist. No one burns Charles Darwin's books, right? They tear down statues. No one's burning his books, okay? But the point is this. Charles Darwin, you know what his really big fear was? He had a lot of fears. One of his big concerns, though, about his theory was how, if my theory is correct, there's the word, right? It's not science. Evolution is not science. If somebody tells you evolution is science, that is, that is called a fallacy of ignorant conjecture. Okay? It's not true because science, by definition, has to be something that you observe with your senses and you apply the scientific method to. And you can't do that when it comes to macroevolution. Okay? I'm not talking about adaptation, microevolution. I'm talking about adaptation. Or I mean a macroevolution. But here's the reality. Charles Darwin was afraid of this. How can it be? What if, if my brain has evolved from a monkey and I don't really, I don't really trust what monkeys think? Right? They're monkeys. And if my brain evolved from a monkey, can I really trust what I'm actually thinking right now? Right? Now that's, that's kind of ingenious. That's like, well, exactly, right? I mean, why don't you just stop there? But he didn't. And so that's the question to, in, in reality, that's the question that you can really ask. Um, to put it another way, I think the way they spin it now, like the brain in the vat question, you ever heard of that? How do you know you're not a brain in a vat right now? How do you know you're not a person in like China and you have some electrodes hooked up to your brain and they're pumping in these, these images that you think are real and they're really not real because you're actually in China? How do you know that that's not you right now? Now, as an unbeliever, what do they have to say? They, say, they have to say, I don't know. I mean, that could be the case, right? That could genuinely be the case. And if they say that, then at that point, they can no longer trust their senses. If they can't trust their senses, they cannot do science because science requires you to trust your senses in order to do the scientific method. But as a Christian, what would you say? How do you know you're not a brain in a vat? Which is kind of, it's kind of tricky for Christians too, isn't it? How do you know you're not a brain in a vat? How do you know you don't have Alzheimer's and you're really like 95 and you just think that you're back in college and you're hearing some weird guy preach? Right? I mean, it's like 90, I've, I've been in, I've preached in Alzheimer units before and it's really sad, you know, it really is. My grandma had Alzheimer's, my great grandma had Alzheimer's. It's, it's really sad. They really do think they are in a different world, right? So how do you know that you're not in that world right now? Right? And you say, well, it's tricky, right? Even as Christians, we're like, well, I, I don't know. But here's the thing, okay? Here's the thing. Even in my grandparents' worst state, there were still moments of clarity, first of all, okay? Second of all, we, we can trust that we believe in a God that is not out to trick us. He's not out to deceive us. He's not out to get us. He's created a reality and he's created us to live in that reality. So there's something that's called law of correspondence. So my, my brain corresponds with the reality that's outside of me perfectly and harmoniously because God has created the reality that I live in to be that way. So this is a long roundabout way of saying, what is truth? What was truth, by the way? Y'all remember the definition? Um, did y'all write it down? Right. Truth is, uh, truth is that which conforms to reality. But reality is defined by God, right? And that's why we can trust our senses. That's why we can trust we're not a brain in a vat. That's why we can trust that God's not out to get us. That's why, and my friends, that's why we can trust in the scriptures. Because we know that God speaks, right? And if God speaks, he's not silent. He speaks, he communicates. We can trust in his speech. And I say that, you know, I know that you're embarking on a... Uh, I mean, I, I tell you, I've been through the university system, and it's, it's a very tough place for Christians to be in. 
but know that obviously you have other Christians here. Praise God, right? You have other believers here. God always has his 7,000 who have not bent the knee to Baal, right? You have Christians. There's people here. Um, in a minute, well, here's my, there's our YouTube page right there, Christ the Wild Ministry. In a minute, I got a gospel track. That way, if you ever, if you ever need anything, reach out to me and I can try to help you as much as I can with anything, okay? Um, but really, that's why I'm here. I mean, I've never dealt with the situation where it's mostly Christians, right? So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, but I, I'm glad it is. Honestly, I'm glad it is. It's a good day to meet so many Christians. You know, so I just want to encourage you in your faith. Keep running the race, you know. Don't lose heart. Don't, don't grow weary. Don't feel like you're the only one. Don't feel like there's no explanation for certain things if you hear about it in class. And you're thinking, man, what is that? The first class I took was an a, a anthropology class in college. And the first thing the guy says is something like, in this class, I'm going to demonstrate why Christianity is bizarre or something like that, like absurd. And I was like, what? What is this? I didn't even know you could say that, right? And then, uh, but the next, like, eight years of my life, I recognize, I realized, you know, that, yeah, not everyone loves Christians. Not, not everyone loves Christianity, right? So, but know this, that you do have the God of the universe who is for you. And like we pointed out in Matthew 28, he has all authority, not only in heaven, but on earth. And not only in the future or in the past, but he has all authority right now. Okay, so right now, Christ is for you. He who is in you, right, is greater than he who is in the world. Okay, so I really, uh, it's, it's been good seeing everybody. It really is good seeing you again, too. So God bless y'all. If y'all want a track, I, I do have a track. If you want contact information, I got it, okay? So God bless y'all. I'll be back next week, probably, hopefully. God willing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned something. So as you got done yesterday, one of the Christian, Christians that came yeah. out. You might be able to report it better than I can. Okay. But um, someone had asked you a question, and your response was um, how David was born a sinner, and the guy, the Christian, came up mm -hmm. to me and said, "Well, that's why I don't agree with. That's why I don't agree with him. He wasn't born a sinner. He was born into sin." And so I just wanted to like, mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that conversation, mm -hmm. but I was just confused because, of course, we're, I, I get how we're born into sin because yeah. of uh, what Adam did. Right. Uh, but I don't understand why he would, uh, I guess, disagree with that statement that you made. Yeah. And I just wanted to clarify that. Cause I oh, can't that's good, though. No, thanks for it. Yeah, because, well, I would say, I guess, you know, most, well, not most, but a lot of people are coming from the perspective. There's really only two groups out there, you know, as far as your belief about humans, as far as birth goes, right? So you either believe you're born in sin or you're born a blank slate. And then as you grow, you uh, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. That's kind of where I would start for sin indeed was given in the world because here's the thing. Everyone, let's say even a child, right? Like logically speaking, the reason I think their argument is, is flawed because they would agree like, like children can die in the womb, right? But, but the reason people die is because of sin, because they're born in sin. Okay. Or because they're born sinners, I guess you could say. Okay. In the sense that, you know what I'm saying? So in There's other no words, difference. yeah, in other words, if, if, there was, if the person was not born with sin, yeah. then they wouldn't die, even in the womb. Okay. That's what I would say. But yeah, I think uh, like Psalm 51. What would you say to someone that I guess Yeah, yeah, that's, I, that's how I would, I would point, to him, point him to Scripture says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And, and David's point here, though, is that he, that's why he's a sinful person. Because this, this, he did inherit it from his mother, but in the same sense that his mother inherited it from her mother all the way back to Adam and Eve. he was born out of wedlock. Yeah, well, oh, David? Oh, I see what you're saying. So he's saying that the context was Bathsheba exactly, and Solomon. Exactly. I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Um, so I would also say this in Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. Psalm 58. And in, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. So he's saying that, that being David. So, but now this is better though, because now he's talking more about like in general, you know, as far as people going astray from birth, speaking lies. Psalm 58, 3. But again, because of sin, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like, I don't think, uh, 
I mean, the reason people die is because of sin. Right, and so I guess the, my, like my, that question was, okay, so what could a, a baby possibly do in, in the womb? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, oh, that's a great question. So there's, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So there's something, um, so the baby, the baby has not committed like an explicit sin. That's a great question. However, it's the inheritance of sin is the problem. Like because we inherited sin from Adam, that's where. So in other words, it's it's called a. Uh, well, really, I think the best way to explain it is like the federal headship of Adam. So Adam was our representative in the garden. So if Adam had conquered, then we would have all conquered. If that makes sense. Like 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 now, Christ is our representative, and Christ defeated death, and 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 so and. When they, if they don't understand the Adam part, I think this is the better way to explain it. Because look, if Adam had defeated sin, then none of his offspring would have died. But he fell into sin, therefore we all die. Now, if they say, well, that seems unfair, then look at what Christ has done. Because he has conquered, we have all defeated sin, even though it wasn't me. And so you can say, well, that's unfair too, right? Because I follow Christ. I didn't do it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in the same same way, I guess someone could say, well, I didn't commit the sin of the garden, okay. but I still inherit that sin. Right. Well, in the same way now as a Christian, I didn't go to the cross, but I still get the reward of going to the cross okay. because I follow Christ. Okay. Whereas before I was a, uh, born in Adam, okay. if that makes exactly. sense. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense, kind of? Yeah, 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 so the problem is the inheritance of what this, the inheritance yes. of sin to that baby in the womb, not necessarily them doing anything. Yeah. I guess, I, I, Even I, if it wasn't like a specific sin. Time, I guess, with, you know, how then that, that baby would... Yes, no, that's a great question too. So, so even when it comes to that, no, I'm sure. Well, these are good questions because so, so the two views on that is obviously really the only two choices as well. All babies go to hell, or I would say, and this goes back to David. David makes a comment about when his son died. He said, "I won't return to him, or or he won't return to me, but I'll go to him," which implies that he's going to be with his son in heaven. And David says that, and also. Um, you know, there's passages even where Jesus says, let the children come to me. And there, there's never anywhere where you see some kind of like description of God damning children. I don't believe that. I believe that Christ. So what I believe is the children that are, let's say, aborted, the children that are miscarried. I believe that they're they go to heaven based on the merits of Christ dying for them on the cross. Just in his sovereignty, knowing that hey, they're going to they're going to be born. They're going to be conceived. They're going to die in the womb, um, or shortly thereafter, and God in His sovereignty, knowing that, died. Christ died for them also. So that's what I believe, and I see David saying this. See, it seems like he says the same thing. Uh, that's in Second Samuel. It's right after Bathsheba. Or so, yeah, yeah. It would be Second Samuel, and then if you look, so it's the child that he has with Bathsheba that dies, and that's when he says that. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate you asking those. Those are good questions. Those are tough questions, though. Those are good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good work. Yeah. How are y'all? Let me get a gospel track. For just that way. That way, you can have one. Yeah, I got. I got. So I got quite a few. I, and I. I uh, yeah. A friend gave them to me. So those are good. And then, uh, and I know y'all. Even if you don't believe in that, that'll help you kind of articulate your beliefs and then yeah, thank you and then that's a good one that's just a plain gospel track but we write our, our own tracks I write my own tracks and so Ryan Ryan Denton yeah. Jay yes sir Jay nice to meet you Jay yeah Jake okay Jake yeah nice to meet you Jay Abbreviated it, huh? Right, right. Yeah, right. There you go, man. That's funny. <laughs> hey, well, it's been good, man. I, I think it's nice to be out here. I've got a little vessel, water bottle off. Do you really? Just like this? Similar. It, it, it's blue. My wife found this one. I love them. Yeah, I think it works well, right? You can tell it's been dinged up. Oh, yeah. You, you drop them and stuff, oh, yeah. 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 That's how they go out here. Thanks for coming out. Well, yeah, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it, it, it's wonderful to have a Christian witness that's a dialogue. Yeah, that's ideal, isn't it? Yeah. That, that's ideal if you can do it that way. I agree. 
Not that there's anything anything wrong with proclamation or anything like that. There's a mandate for that. Right. But I think in this culture and day and age, there's there's, there's a deeper response that happens with engagement. Yeah, it definitely helps. I prefer that. You know, I start out with proclamation and just kind of see what happens. I mean, that, that's a great way to build a crowd. Then once the crowd's there, yeah, that's how I exactly. Yeah. Well, see, even with proclamation, I, I still prefer dialoguing through proclamation if you can do it through preaching. You know. So it just depends, man, what the day's like. That makes sense. You know yeah. what I mean? Just kind of what the Lord does. But yeah, it's good meeting you, Jake. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be coming out hopefully regularly. I live in College Station now. Oh, awesome. So you, you go to the A&M, I take it? I'm going to, God willing. I'm going to tomorrow, actually. It starts awesome. tomorrow. So I'll be out there. Um, I mean, my contact information is on there, too, man, on the back. Well, awesome. my email is christinthewild at gmail.com. Cool. Easy. So, so, but I hope to see you out here again too, man. Definitely. Hopefully next week. Well, I'm I'm on staff with Chi Alpha. Oh, nice. And okay. So, um, we, we uh, I, I'm sure that the Chi Alpha out there will, will appreciate you out there. Too. Cool, man. I hope so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. I'm glad you know them out there too. Oh yeah, I know. We're pretty tight family, which is awesome. You know, you you got like contact for them. If you can, tell them I'll be out there tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Out in front of the Soli. I don't know if you. Okay. Soli statue. They'll, they'll know. Tell them. Yeah. Tell them where they usually preach. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Because because. Them on staff, and I think they even have their, their like their future small group leaders go out and preach on campus. Too. Oh, that's great! Well, if you can tell them, I'm not like a shock and awe kind. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, let them know, cause, you know, like when you're first doing it, people don't know how to distinguish. Exactly. So. Well, and, 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 and when you have to project, it comes across as yelling, which makes people. It think, does. Oh, it does. You know? It does. It's that's just right. the nature of the thing. Well, quite honestly, this is a great area because you don't really have to yell. It's true. It, it it's got a nice acoustic here. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so I appreciate it, Jake. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, man, I'm Ryan, and, and hopefully I'll see you around, right? Yes. Next week. I'll plan to be back next week. You guys are doing good. So, I'll go ahead and just... I, I have a question. Okay. All right. I, I don't... Okay. Predestined free will. Yeah. Where do you where do you lie on it? Okay, so, yeah, you know, so I didn't come out and say it. Yeah. Um, but I definitely believe in the predestination. Yeah. Um, um, Even prede- predestined to damnation? No. So I would say that, that there is a different way, or we'll put it this way, the way, let's come over here yeah, if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. The way that God, so God positively saves people. Yes. But he does not positively damn people to hell is what I believe. Yeah. So in other words, I do believe in predestination. But I believe, and I believe in election. Yeah. But I believe that when it comes to hell, people go to hell basically on their own initiative. Yeah. And uh, and and another way to look at it, I think, is kind of like the reverse. So rather than looking at it and saying, "Well, that's unfair of God to save <laughs> only some," I say that's really gracious of God to save any at all. That's true. So you seem like you have somewhat of a Calvinistic bent to you. Me? Um, I, what do you I, think? So, the way I... I know it's a dirty word, man. I know it is, right? You, you might be cool with me, though. You'd be surprised. Right. Well, here's the thing. I, I I I listen to a lot of Tim Keller. Okay. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, he's Presbyterian. Yeah, so, so realistically, the, the way I, I view it is I don't think it's either or. I think it's both. Let me get this guy. Hey, man. How are you? Hello. Did you have any questions about the sign today? No. Okay, well, we'll come back next week. We'll be talking about truth if you want to hear it. Uh, okay. So have a good day, man. I didn't know. Yeah, so Tim Kelly says both and. Yeah, so I, okay. I, because, and so the way, I, the way I look at it, you, you can. That's good, man. T- t- tell me if there's any fallacies okay. in this, but. Um, so God's all knowing, right? He's yeah. sovereign. Uh-huh. So, so he, he knows everything, which means that he knows every decision that we can make and the repercussions thereof, which means he's still uh-huh. all knowing. But if we're made in his image, that means okay. we have choice. And if we have love, that means it requires a choice. Okay. So he knows every decision we can make. Okay. And so he sees every possible outcome. So he's still all knowing. Okay. And he gives us the free will of choice. That way we can choose him or choose not him. Okay. So okay. God, okay. Cause, cause God does not rejoice in the punishment of the wicked, right? Okay. He wishes that, that, that no one perish yeah. and all would be saved. So therefore to say that some are predestined to be damned, mm-hmm. it, go, it go, goes in face of those scriptures. Okay. Because otherwise he wouldn't have created them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I, and I, yeah, okay. I get that. So That's good. 
But I do believe that that inherently he wants all to be saved, which means we are all predestined to be saved. I see. But some choose Bye. not to. Bye. Good seeing y'all. Bye. Take care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. God, yep. God bless. So, yeah, so, so uh, You know, that's good, man. I don't know. Uh, yeah, in a sense, yeah, because I, I think, well, first of all, I look at it, I'm thinking, okay, this is something that is, we only have like a, gla- a glimpse of what God is actually doing when it comes to this. Oh, yeah. But we do have enough, like you're pointing out, we do have enough to recognize there's predestination, there is election, there are people that go to hell. Yes, 100%. Not everyone goes to heaven. So what is going on? Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting take, though, man. I, yeah. I, I, I would have to think on that to kind of try to wrap my head around yeah, that. Be, as far because as then it, it keeps him sovereign, keeps yeah. him all knowing, uh-huh. but it also allows us the, the, the dignity of being made in his image to have free will. So when it comes to the will, yeah, 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 that's good. Because so the way I look at free will, I like what you said, is I would say our wills are free to operate within the sphere that our heart allows. Yeah. So if I have a heart that's set on evil, yep. and then then I am not I I am free to operate within that circle, but I cannot I cannot do what's right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So in that sense, if you were to say, well, do you have free will? I would say that will is not free mm-hmm. in the libertarian sense. Yeah. But it is free to operate within the boundaries mm-hmm. like as a Christian. I am not free. Paul even called himself a slave to Christ, That's right? True. I am not free to let's say go and and just get sloppy drunk. Oh yeah. God won't I just can't do that anymore, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there are sins that I fall into, but of course, yeah. There are sins I just won't, you know, and I can't do. And so I would say that in a sense you could even say like with the Christian, my my will is bound by God's restraint on me. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I would agree with that. So yeah, I think, but that's a that's a great topic, man. Free will. Yeah, I don't know. It's just it's a, it's interesting. I mean, and realistically, no one's gonna have perfect theology this side of eternity. That's it, man. So it's like that's it too. That's a big that's a big point right there. So major on the majors, minor on the minors, right? Mm-hmm. It's like do I believe Jesus is the Son of God that he that he, that he, that he lived, died, and was buried, and r- r- rose from the dead. That he's my yep. Lord and Savior. Amen. Yeah, I'm yep. saved. I'm yep. good. Yeah, on that and, and my you know. You'll know a tree by its fruit. Mm-hmm. So, through his enablement and his help and his power, he, he enables me to do good things. Right. It's not based on my exactly. own goodness. Exactly. Right. Oh, that's and, good, man. You got it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, and it's like, and, and, and it's his goodness that moved my heart to come to him, because he's because yep. it's his grace. It's yep. a gift. You know, it's a gift. Yep. So it's not something that I could just go go willing to do. He had to break yep. my heart. To exactly. Do so. Right. So. So yeah. Amen, dude. Man, thanks, yeah, you got so it, man. You nailed out. it. I'm I'm in agreement with you on that. Likewise. Yeah, that's good stuff, brother. Um, yeah, I'll be out next week, man. Awesome. I look forward to more talking to you more too. Yeah, it'd be Come fun. Out, yeah. Yeah, anytime, anytime. No, it's it's wonderful. I, Jake, right? Yeah, and Jake. Ryan. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah. Ryan, okay. Cool, man. Well, it's good meeting you. Yeah, shoot a text to those Texas A&M guys if you don't mind. Yeah, we'll do. Let them know I'll come out and, and uh, you know, if you got any questions between now and then, let me know. Cool, we'll do. Anything to say. Thanks, Ryan. Good talking to you, man. You keep bless keep you. fighting the good fight. Likewise. You guys are doing good out here, man. Likewise. God bless you, brother. Thank you. God bless you. What's up, man? How's it going? Good. How you doing? Oh, yeah, 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 of course, man. What's up, dude? Nice to meet you. What's your name? Jeremiah. Jeremiah? Nice to meet you, Jeremiah. No, that's good, though. That's good. I, I, you know, that's the way to do it. You guys are out here. Yeah. You know, in a sense, we're serving the same. Oh, absolutely. That's good, man. I'm glad you got to do that. I didn't, I didn't meet, like, hardly any unbelievers, though. I know they're out here. I met a lot yesterday. Yeah. Maybe because of the hybrid thing, you know? Like, uh, oh, really? Well, because it's like, if you have a class of 100 people, there's only a third of those people are going to be on campus at any point. Exactly, dude. So you guys, really know, so. so can you tell us, is it like, is it like noticeably thinner out here today? Like it, a, dude, it is, yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good sign, man. Maybe they'll open it up next semester Hopefully. or something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is. Especially if it's like yeah, right. That'd be good, huh? It'll probably happen. I mean, normally, like, is this your first time? I've never seen you. I came out here yesterday and then today. I'm talking about, like, the first year. Come out yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, dude, in the past, like, 
creatures usually, I mean, they get a yeah. bunch of people yeah. coming out here. Yeah. And a lot of times people that are, you know, trying to be critical or. Yeah, 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 sure. Our, our pastors in, in the past have said like, in the past, in the past, in the past have said like, just because you don't, just because you don't like the way that they say things doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah, no, that's true, man. There's a, yeah, there's, and. So, I mean, I, I disagree probably with most of the guys that are coming out here as far as their theology, and but I do believe in preaching. You know, I will say that. You know, and I, I love you know, the preaching. The gospel, it yeah, really yeah, exactly. It, 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 yeah, and don't get me wrong. I mean, things get stirred up when I preach too. So, you know, I mean, it's like so you can do it as mellow as you think you can, and you're still gonna. But you got it. You're still dealing with unbelievers. Exactly. No, there's still there's a level of life. It's not like you're trying to stir the pot to like, like mm -hmm. intentionally anger people per se, but like it, what you're doing is you're calling out sin in their hearts. Yeah. Which is like, and and then like that's like a there's a manifestation of evil there that like does not want to get. That's into, right, dude. You know? so, that's so true, man. So they they react right. There will be a, a reaction that usually is probably not a very kind one in general. You know. That's right. So, that's right, dude. Well, I'm glad you guys are out here helping though, man. That's, that's awesome. That's how it should be, you know. Yeah. You guys come out here and do the groundwork. Yeah, it has to be like that. I mean, and normally, like I said, there's so usually so many people out here that come and listen to street preachers that like it's good to come out and like. I didn't see you yesterday, but I heard about you, and then I was like, dang, if I would have known, yeah, I right. out here and tried to talk to people that were right. here because that's a gold mine. That's right. Easy that's exactly, dude. They're just like, standing here, already ready to talk. Exactly. They're already. That's ready great. Y'all know that over here. That's great. Yeah. I see, man. Hey, buddy. That's good that you guys know that, huh? So, what, are you part of an organization or just like solo? What's it? I'm with Christ in the Wild Ministries. Christ in the Wild Ministries. Yeah, this is our, here's our track. We got other tracks too. But that's the YouTube page down there, and then the. So do, you, do you post content? On I do I, a lot. Yeah. 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 Cool. We definitely do. So if you go to the page, I I put the stuff from yesterday up there too already. Okay. So. Oh, check that out. I, uh, I really am into that stuff. There's there's some guys on YouTube that do this stuff that are, tend to be. And they're not saying anything wrong, but they allow themselves to get caught up in really silly. Uh -huh. I agree, silly. dude. I've seen those guys. They come out here too, don't they? Some of them. Let me hand out some of these tracks real quick. What's up, guys? Hey, man. Good to see you again. Did, you get, did I give you one of those earlier? So. Yeah, check that out. That's just a plain gospel track. Hey, hey man. man. What's up, dude? Awesome. Doing good? Good, good, good. Hey, I'm so happy that you're here, man. I'm glad you guys are here, man. Y'all are helpful. I appreciate that. Y'all are awesome, man. Dude, y'all are great, man. Good work, fellas. This is this is cool, man. It's like appreciate the way you preach. I didn't. Well, I, yeah, by God's grace, you know, some days are calmer than others. So that's that's cool. I appreciate it. Yeah, I've gotten yelled at out here before. So. Yeah, yeah, right. You, you know, how to, yeah. Sometimes you can you can do it as gently as possible. They well, still there's blow people up. that don't even listen. They just see you up there and immediately assume they just make fun and yell they at just, you. They, they do. Around. It's like it's not it's not civil. Like I did yesterday. Um, that lady who bought a taser apparently. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I forgot about that. She did. That was so uncivilized. That so that so that's not. One of the. <laughs> yeah, she, she bought a taser. I forgot about that, she man. Get, she said I did to get some attention. I'm like, that's not a good way to get someone's attention. That's right. Very rude and just what are you doing? Very responsive. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. I think that's yeah, kind of an illegal way to get someone's attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah it should be, right? Like shooting up a gun in the exactly. air or something. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not illegal, though. Like, yeah. hey, you know, like, did you get one of these, man? Like, cool, dude. It's good, good seeing you out here. Yeah, no, it's good seeing you, man. What's your name? Caleb, I'm Ryan. Yeah, nice to meet you, Caleb. It's good meeting all you guys. You guys are doing good, yeah. No, I don't, God's grace, dude. I don't know if I am withstanding. I'm like... About the fate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some other guys that come out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, man. Enjoy it. What's up? Well, you guys are good being out here. I appreciate it, man. I'll come out next week. When will you guys Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'll try to come out next we're week, guys. About, we're talking about, yeah. We'll yeah I'll around. be back next week, yeah. Did you guys get a track? Yeah, you got one. Did you get one? Thank you, man. Yeah, did you guys get one? All right, man. There you go, dude. Hey, by the way, it's so I got, I want to bring you a, a book. I got a book on open air preaching. You weren't in the group chat. I got to get it to you, man. It's, it's, uh, supposedly it's been useful for a lot of guys. So I'll bring that out. Uh, I'll come back next week. So I'll bring that out to you. So good. So I see, I'll, I'll pass it on. Anybody else, if, if anybody else want to preach, let me know, you know, and, and I'll try to, even if you're not out here, I'll at least, you know, you can at least be equipped in the process. You know what I mean? So when you are ready, you, you're ready. But, but, you know, in a sense, we're never ready. <laughs> you know, there's also that. But it's, it's awesome meeting you guys. What's up, man? It's good meeting you. I'm glad you guys are here. Are you guys, are you guys brothers? Oh, same beer. That's why I asked. Same beer. I'm trying to grow one too, man. It's, it just takes time, right? So, you're. Uh, what ministry? Christ in the Wild Ministry. Yeah, we got a YouTube page. You see the YouTube, just type in Christ in the Wild Ministries and then um, you can go to ChristintheWild.com. It's on the back of that that card. That'll get you there too. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff, you know, all the media stuff. So, yeah, reach out, man. I'll remember your name. Um, uh, Jason? Jamin. Jamin. Yeah. Jamin. Okay. What's your name? Christian. Christian. All right. I can remember that one. <laughs> you got an easy one. <laughs> Jamin and Christian. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, let's do that. And then, yeah, if you have any questions at all, any of you guys, reach out to me. My, I, I got a contact page on there. So good? Yeah. All right, guys. Well, God bless you guys. I'll see you next week, God willing. All right. God bless you. God bless you, man. Did you get a track? It's good seeing you out here, dude. You were here yesterday or no? Yeah. I thought you were, yeah. You were sitting over there, huh? Yeah. Yeah, right on, man. It's good seeing you again. Yeah. Found some shade today or no? It was hot out there, right? Oh, yeah. Yesterday we had the cloud cover. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah, I exactly. You know, any of these guys? Yeah, we're all in the same. Right on, man. Cool. Well, cool, man. It's good seeing you out here. I'll come back next week, God willing. We'll be here. All right, man. It's good to see friendly faces. It's surprising, actually. <laughs> like, wow. All right. But you guys, let me know if you need anything, okay? My information's on that track. You got a YouTube page here, too, if you want anything, with the Christ the Wild Ministries. Cool, man. What's your name? Galen. Galen? All right, dude. I'm Ryan. God bless you, man. We'll see you. All right, take care.